Easy to predict where we'd find Jack Charlton the week before an international. A freestanding gubber was the successful bait. We'll meet Warren Barton, once a small fish in the city. He could make his England debut in Dublin on Wednesday. And once again, the glittering prize could be denied. Why conference success could leave Macclesfield as frustrated as Kidderminster. For Gary Lineker, topics from every extreme of the domestic scene will also be talking live to the Manchester City boss Brian Horton and rounding up all the midweek action, starting with what went right and what went wrong in this week's FA Cup fourth round replays. The FA Cup breathed life into Chelsea's season a year ago, but now Glenn Hoddle's only diversion from a relegation threat is Europe. It could have been a different story if one or two close refereeing calls had gone his way. On a night when penalties proved decisive, Chelsea had strong claims turned down. Gavin Peacock robbed of a shooting chance by Tony Witter's questionable tackle right on the border. But the spot kicks came later, much later. Wise. Onside, Steen. Score! Given away by Spencer. That's a good ball by Witter to Thatcher. And it's in by Savage. Yay! Well, they've Yay! well deserved it, Millwall. Really good comeback. The penalty competition decider was quite literally spot on. The two goalkeepers, little more than spectators of the first nine kicks. Alex Ray made it five out of five for Millwall and put his goalkeeper, Casey Keller, at match point. And John Spencer, of course, now has to score. And he does And Millwall go through. Through to Queen's Park Rangers in the next round. To the scalp of Arsenal had been added that of Chelsea a source of boundless celebration. But the dramatic nature of the victory lit the blue touch paper, and the sort of fireworks that a criminal minority had had in mind all night went off. The police reacted quickly to limit the violence, but it's the reaction of the football authorities that will decide how much the unwanted few have spoiled things for the rest. Football holds its breath and crosses its fingers that this was an isolated incident. Another Russian roulette shootout at Molyneux. Packed to its impressive rafters for the rematch with Sheffield Wednesday, who were denied by a penalty save late in the first match. It wasn't the last of the time. Dennison takes it. Oh, Preston has missed it! It's in by Kelly! And the Sheffield Wednesday keeper just never got a grip of it at all. Pulled down by Bart Williams. Hide shot, stopped on the line. Bright has it in. It's 1-1, Mark Bright. In injury time, in extra time, Mark Bright could have scored a game. Should have scored a game. But the agony felt on the pitch and off the pitch by the Wednesday camp at that moment was nothing compared to what was still to come. This was to be a tie break with almost as many misses as hits. Andy Thompson took the first Wolves penalty. Robbie Dennison took their second. Keeper Kevin Pressman actually scored from the spot to make it 3-0 to Wednesday. All they needed was one more success to win through. But Andy Pearce failed. And with Chris Wall reluctant to take the last, it was Chris Bart Williams who was the man denied by Paul Jones. So to sudden death and Waddle, still tossing and turning from the nightmare of a World Cup semi five years ago, was put on the spot again. Waddle, it's saved! And poor Chris Waddle. I bet he never wants to take another penalty in the rest of his career. It's Goodman. And it's Wolves who go through. 
through to a home tie with Leicester City, through to the relief of their famous manager, through to the disbelief of a wonderful player haunted by two woeful moments. Liverpool have long since stopped taking Anfield Cup replays against more modest opponents for granted. They finished off First Division Burnley with a single goal headed home by a hopelessly unmarked John Barnes. It wasn't plain sailing for them though, and they navigated the final minutes of the match without Neil Ruddock, whose untimely and untypical slip seemed to have let Liam Robinson in for a late equaliser. Ruddock's trip saved him from that embarrassment, but nothing could save him from the most severe penalty the referee was empowered to administer. A red card for Ruddock, only a free kick 40 yards out for Burnley though. Another First Division team, Luton Town, left their hard luck stories behind in their first game with Southampton. Alan Borsight head for Tottenham in round five on the back of a thumping replay win. Still Dodd. It's a good run. Schiphol is in there. And he's still in there. And Letizia. Well, if you give him chances like that, the ball's only going to finish in one place. He need. That was Magilton. Oh, given away by Mitchell Thomas. It's Magilton to Letizia. Tripoli comes near post. The field of the hands. Penalty. Mitchell Thomas is the offender. And Matt Letizia has the chance to make it 3 0. And does. is uh, Magilton to Letizia. They're getting some good possession in there, Southampton. Here he is again. Now, what's he going to do this time? Oh, it's a cunning one, and it's four. That is Heaney. Letizia again. Oh, and Schiphol is there, and Moncow's there. And it's number five. This is uh, in by Kenner. Oh, and that's Magilton making it for Hughes. Oh, I'll tell you what, that is some finish. By the lad, not even on for a few minutes. It's been a long, hard winter for Coventry City, and no sign of a thaw after another replay that went the distance. Norwich City were in front early on, playing some of the trademark football that's deserted them somewhat since the turn of the year. Mark Bowen completing a stylish build-up for Mike Sheeran to open the scoring. It was all squared by half-time, though. Sean Flynn and Peter Undlove getting their heads together to equalise. Extra time was again called upon to pick a winner. When it arrived, Norwich scored twice in five minutes to book their trip to Everton in round five. First, young Darren Eady wrapped his foot around a Jeremy Goss centre. And before Coventry could get their breath back, they were knocked out by a real sucker punch. Just who delivered it is a bit of a mute point, but Mike Sheeran claimed the goal despite the desperate touches of both Pickering and Agrizovic en route. And with that scruffy goal, the lineup for the last 16 at last became clear. And over the week's cup action, we've just heard that the first division match between Oldham and Middlesbrough has become another victim of the weather today. Oldham against Middlesbrough is off. But, um, Gary, looking back on cup affairs of the week, I suppose the message to carry out of Stamford Bridge is don't get complacent. The possibility of crowd trouble will always be with us. Well, we'll always have these things, sadly. Um, it's much better. It's important to say that much better than it was ten years ago. We've still got abusive fans, we've seen the Cantona thing, we've seen the attacking of the referee, there's still racial abuse and these isolated incidents and let's hope they stay that way. Um, but it's important not to just you know, forget about them and pretend they don't exist because they do and, and obviously need condemning. But equally the game is right to resist the calls for fences to go back up again and so on. Yeah, you've got to you know, keep things in perspective. That, I mean the fencing thing was proved to be um, fatal. And said it last week, said again, you know, let's get the crowd to police themselves, um, neighbourhood watch, call it what you like, oh. um, to stamp it out. Families are coming back to the game, let's make sure we keep them. Yeah, was superbly handled as well by police and also by the club. Absolutely, I think everything was, was stopped very quickly, the police were great and the club have um, handled the situation very well, so let's hope they don't punish the club because it's, you know, they've done as much as they can there.
One other aspect worth your view, poor old Chris Waddle has to confront some old demons again after that penalty miss, doesn't he? Yeah, when he was walking up to it, I was watching and I just... You know that it's got to be going through his mind, the, the, the previous one, and obviously that was far more important, but um, it would have just brought back so many memories for him. Uh, you had to feel from a bit there. Yeah. But he's a big boy now, he'll get over it. Talking of big boys, potentially making a return to action is Peter Shilton. After his managerial stint at Plymouth came to a halt, somewhat acrimoniously, he's in training to provide cover for Hans Sagers at Wimbledon, in particular for next Sunday's fifth round FA Cup tie at Liverpool. Signed by Joe Kinnear for a week, because reserve keeper Neil Sullivan is suspended. 45 years old, Shilton may well be uh, starting a whole new career. still feel I've got something to offer. I think goalkeeping is not just about your actual ability. I mean, it's about experience, it's about talking, uh, you know, it's about your mental attitude. And I feel I've still got a bit to offer. I think, you know, George Foreman's 45 and he's world champion boxer. So I don't think there's any, any reason why I can't play. Uh, the one thing I... I'm a little bit dubious about is just if you pick up one or two little injuries, which obviously when you get to 45, um, they're not as easy to overcome. Kind of character who could make a comeback at 45, isn't he? Yes, he his hair's as short as George Foreman's now, <laughs> isn't it? But he's, no, he's a great goalkeeper. He's one of the all-time greats, um, hero of mine. Um, when I was a kid, ended up rooming with him with England, which was great. And it's good to see him. Um, back in the thing, who knows, he might come and play in the cup final now and sure. I mean, long term, uh, being a goalkeeper, there could be a future for him over the next five years as sort of permanent standby around the country, week here, week there. With the 20 years knowing him, he looks, in, he looks in great shape. Um, who knows um, what's going to happen, but it's, it's good to see him involved in the game. Uh, you know, he must give, have something to offer the game, uh, especially probably in a goalkeeping coach capacity. I mean, nobody knows the job better than him. Needs a bit of luck. We also hear this week that uh, Stuart Pearce is considering a move from Nottingham Forest to Japan. Two-year deal worth in excess of a million pounds is on offer. Here's what Forest manager Frank Clark thinks of the situation. I'll be trying uh, as hard as possible to persuade him to stay. Um, and ultimately, I could say, well, you know, you've got two and a half le years left of that contract. You're not going anywhere. Uh, I, I don't want to do that if I can. I, I'm, I'm mindful of the interests of the football club but I also have to be mindful of, uh, of the interests of, of my players as individual people you know and uh, as I say the, the opportunity would, would be there um, all things being equal for Stuart to, to you know set himself up uh, for the rest of his life and I'd be reluctant to deny him that opportunity uh, as I say I've got to try my main uh, interest is to, is to look after the, uh, the club's interests the money is tempting for sure, but Gary, from your experience, what other uh, things should Stuart be prepared to confront if he moves to Japan? Well, the level of football is, is a lot lower. You've got to realise that before you go, but what you are doing is, is, is pushing the game in another country, which is good. Um, he, he'll be going to a newly formed club called Kobe, if it, if, if it happens, um, who are not actually in the J-League, so the level will be even lower. It will probably be non-league standard, but it'll be comfortable for him. There'll be no pressure. They'll love him. Um, they won't expect too much and he'll find the game easy because someone that plays like him, especially a defender, will, will really dominate the game there. Um, the people are great, they'll, they'll make him, give him a good reception. Um, there's a large um, British um, contingent in, in Kobe, um, a lot of yeah. British people there. Um, obviously they've had the earthquake, prior to the earthquake it was, it was a beautiful city. Um, one of the nicest in Japan, so I mean it's certainly a nice place to, to live and a great experience if you treat it like that. Will make him financially secure as well. It's not exactly become a well-trodden path since, since you pioneered the way. Well, no, because there's a lot of Brazilians there. It's, it's dominated by the Brazilians. There's probably 75% of the foreign players there. And each club's are actually restricted to three foreign players that can play. So um, there is a, a few players from other countries, but by and large it is from South America. He has to make his mind up then. Let's uh, take a look at the top of the FA Carling Premiership, emphasising that Manchester United could take over at the top if they win the Manchester Derby at Main Road today. Blackburn could regain the lead after their match at home to Sheffield Wednesday on Sunday. Well, United kept up the pressure on Rovers with their victory against Aston Villa a week ago. For United fans, the mood was set ten minutes before the kick-off. The applause for one of their favourites, Mark Hughes, who had just signed a two-year contract. Come the match, he and they would applaud the arrival of the new boy. It's Giggs to take the corner for United. Pallister's up there. Oh, yes, turned in! And he's done it! 
Andy Cole. And the ground welcomes the first successful strike by the £7 million pound man. A strike which left Blackburn just two points clear when they arrived next day at Tottenham for what proved to be the Nick Barmby show. First, as accurate provider for the excellent run of Jurgen Klinsmann. The shot through the legs of Bobby Mims, the former Spurs goalkeeper, bringing the Germans 13th goal in the league in the 18th minute. Paul Mims could do nothing about the second. Darren Anderton shot, clipping the shin of Colin Hendry and going into the other corner. But the lead, just short of the half hour, was no more than Spurs deserved for some exhilarating football. Blackburn, who won matches when playing less well, briefly raised their hopes early in the second half. First through the industry of Chris Sutton, chasing a nothing ball. Then the nod of Alan Shearer and the finish of Tim Sherwood, whose performance fully justified the England call, which was to follow. As more obviously did Bambi's, whose driving header sealed Spurs' victory in spectacular style. So, if United win the Manchester derby against a team who haven't won in nine, they'll go back to the top. But as Southampton found in a match of curious goals, City can be hard to shake off, even after Tony Coton's 24th-minute gift gave them the opening goal. No, Simon Charlton's cross hadn't curled out. The equaliser arrived six minutes later, head on, head up. The scorer, Alan Conaghan. On the hour, Matthew Letizier entered the score sheet, firing acutely through Nicky Summerby and the substitute goalkeeper, Dibble. But as two defenders followed Bigri's cross to Rossler, they left Gary Flickcroft unmarked and City saved themselves two minutes from time. Bottom of the table with desperate problems now facing Ipswich and Leicester. Above them, only five points cover the next ten sides. So for Manchester City, this afternoon's derby game with United is as important as any. But this is Main Road still soaking up the rain and uh, the pitch there has already survived one inspection. That was at midday and now I understand another inspection is scheduled for 1.15 but conditions getting worse all the time. Ground staff working hard but a lot of moisture and a lot of standing water down the middle of the pitch and in the goal mouths especially. If the game does go ahead, the conditions are going to be very testing, to say the least. Well, the city boss, Brian Horton, is talking now with John Modson. Well, Brian, what do you make of the conditions? They look nice at the moment, John. Um, I think it, it adds for exciting football when the surface is a little bit like that. I just hope it doesn't get any worse because a couple of weeks ago it was a, a little bit similar to that when we played Leicester. And as it went on, it be became a total farce. You know, we ended up losing the game to a, 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 a stupid goal where the ball just wouldn't run out of play, stopped in the water. So I, I hope it doesn't get farcical. That's the, my only concern. Well, referee Philip Don's going to look again at quarter past one. But uh, let's assume the game's on for a moment anyway. Uh, you described that defeat at Old Trafford earlier in the season as the worst time of your career. I, I think it is. Um, to lose that badly in, in a local derby that means so much to people. Uh, was a, an horrific uh, result for us and I think we owe something to our supporters to ourselves today to try and put that right because even before your time I mean it's six years since City beat United in the league 1989 but it was 5-1 here and funnily enough it was a season when Alex Ferguson was said to be under pressure before he won a trophy um, Alex said to me uh, right after the game and I mean that they just beaten us 5-0 it's easy to say but he said I had to live with that and you'll have to live with that for a little while I mean they were good words because he, know, he knew how I felt after the game um, and it was hard to take I mean, to lose like that. But you, you, you're quite right, that was our last win here, 5-1 over them. So let's hope we can, we can turn the tables today. It's also been described as a derby match in which a draw is not ideal for either team. No, it isn't really, because they're obviously chasing Blackburn again and got close. And we need some, we need some wins, John. We've, we've had too many draws. And the games here, where we should have won over the last few weeks, Villa 2-0 up, drew 2-2, uh, should have beaten Coventry for, for me and Leicester. First half, we played very, very well in, in similar conditions to those. So I hope we play well today. I just want to widen the subject here a moment before we go back to Gary Lineker and Steve Ryder because this morning there's a story in the Daily Mail that the, Super, the Premier League, tier, tier 2 if you like, another Premier League, is possibly going to go ahead in 1996. Another elite coming into football, would you say? Well, 
I, I, we've heard stories about it. Uh, I, I did a sports forum with Mr. Stott from Oldham the other night, and he said that he wasn't aware of that situation, and, and he certainly wouldn't be for it. Um, I hope we don't sort of start going away from the smaller clubs a little bit too much, John. We need them. We've, we've had for over 100 years here 92 league clubs. And where do, where do big clubs get the, small, uh, the players from? From some of the smaller clubs. And we need that. Um, I think there's still plenty of room for the small clubs. I mean, you came through the Luton and Holes, didn't you? I mean, you wouldn't want to see them cut off. Well, Port Vale, I started at six years, and, you know, it's a good grounding for people. Where did David Platt come from eventually? He wouldn't have got another chance if they had no uh, lower, lower league clubs. He'd have probably been lost forever. I think the game needs them, John. Well, it's an interesting talking point, Brian. Let's see if Gary or Steve want to add to that. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Yes, thanks, John. Thanks, Brian. And um, the elite really moving away from the grassroots of, of the league structure. Not a good thing. Well, I think what does need to be done is a reduction in the amount of games that are played. Um, that's true. But I don't think we need to reduce it by too, too far. We don't want a league of ten. Um, but I think certainly 18 teams will be um, beneficial to the game. As regards this afternoon's derby game up there at Main Road, conditions look absolutely awful, but Brian Horton quite fancies it, doesn't he? Well, he does, and he's always up, isn't he? I mean, he's, he's supposedly under pressure. He's, his job's on the line seemingly every week. Um, whether it is or not, we don't really know, but that's what um, is portrayed. But he's a um, bubbly character, very enthusiastic, does his job well, and, and he's done a good job at Manchester City. Um, they've had a bad run. He's still in the cup, though. And he, I think he could do with a win against um, the old enemy. Derby games, you can always seemingly disregard league form and, uh, and, and league position. And in today's conditions especially, so I would have thought. Yeah, they're not great conditions to play. If it gets to the stage where the ball won't run in the water, then they're better off calling it off. But um, when it's a bit slippy and slidey, anything can happen. And as you quite rightly said, in derbies, they are, they are one-off occasions. And um, even a team that's um, perhaps a little inferior to the other can raise his game on the day. Another inspection due there at 1.15. We'll keep you in touch with the results of that. Uh, Sports Night on Wednesday features England's first international of the year in Dublin against the Republic of Ireland. Now, matches against Jack Charlton's side have taken on a real edge and meaning in recent years. Through it all, though, Jack has kept his priorities in place, as Tony Gubber discovered. Jack Charlton's life is a balance of passions. The boiling tempers of 105 degree Orlando offer stark contrast to a freezing winter's morning on Scotland's River Tay. The Republic's friendly international against England looms next week, but manager Jack is thinking about bigger fish, hopefully an elusive spring salmon. Nine years into the job, two World Cups visited, a European Championship next, and still Jack does it his way. When you're in the river, Jack, are you, are you thinking about the match next week? Only when people ask like you. <laughs> then it, it brings me mind back to the game. But at the moment, no. I mean, uh, I am thinking about a little bit about it at the moment because I've just been on the phone to home and I've got to heard a phone a couple of managers about players releasing them and things like that uh, at lunchtime. So I really, while I'm here, I'm still working. But once I'm fishing, uh, unless the phone goes, I don't tend to think too much about football. After the World Cup, Jack, there were probably a lot of people who thought that, that you might feel that was the occasion to, to pack it in and spend more time fishing and get away from the, the stress and strains of it all. Was, was that never no, an option? No, I, I, I really... Uh, people chase me. They're always trying to find out when you're going to give it up. I said I would take the Irish through to the next the European Championships. And then I would have a little think again about what I'm going to be doing after that. By then, I think it'll probably be time for a change. But, uh, I mean, that's, that's in the future. Who knows? Who knows? I don't know what I'd do without football. I mean, I, I, I like my fishing, but I also like my football. But the two sides of your personality, Jack, are so different, aren't they? The intensity and the public scrutiny of the international matches and all the, the ballyhoo that goes yeah. with that. And then here, when there's, there's nobody in any direction for ten miles. Well, this can be as frustrating as football. <laughs> I mean, I've been here four days and never had a pull. Well, I got one, but it was what you call a baggot, which had to go back into the river. But uh, it can be very frustrating in this business as well. How important is the game for you against England? Oh, it's a game that we would love to win. I mean, the Irish would love to beat the English. They don't do it very often. 
But we have done it once under me. And we've, we've never lost to England since I took the job. And we would like that to continue. And I think we would like to beat the English in Dublin. Who, who do you fear in the England setup? Oh, the, 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 I envy the, um, the, them having the Alan Shearers and the Lace Ferdinands and the, all, all the forward players that they've got available to them. I could do with a, really a couple now of them. Andy Cole's not Irish, is he? I've tried. No, he's not. <laughs> we, we would, uh, we're getting a bit short of... I, I could do with a good forward player, someone with a bit of pace. You know, and, uh, but England have got them all. You're looking around, obviously, for something. Oh, yeah, we look like... all the time. I mean, that's what all we do is look. We've, we've got young Jason, who's looking like a good player. We've got Gary Kelly, who's looking like a good player. We've, we've got Phil Babb, who's getting better every time he plays. Um, so we're not too bad. We've, we've found three in the last year. We may find another three in the next year. Let's hope you find some salmon as well. <laughs> well, I'm, four days I've been here, not a pull. Well, I caught, the, I caught the baggot. I caught the baggot over there. <laughs> But it's, uh, it's very relaxing, this. The, the, the hectic bit starts next week. Good job, we knew where to find you. <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> of course you know where to find me. <laughs> Get, getting access to me has been the problem. <laughs> There's that a relax, isn't it? Your kind of manager, I should think. He is. I think if you caught one of those Scottish chamois, he'd claim it as Irish. <laughs> but uh, he's, no, he's a great guy. He's, he's a real enthusiast and... Um, He's a, such an enthusiastic guy with, with his football and everything else that he, I think he probably makes players really want to play for him. And of course, as you know very well, England have never beaten one of his sides. Yeah, I know <laughs> very well. I've played about four of them. But um, tough team to play against. Deny you space, make life difficult. Got some good players as well. Um, it's no fluke that they've done well in, in the last two World Cups. And it'll be a really, uh, as always, a difficult game for England. Got a match with a lot of interest coming into the England squad for Wednesday's match are Sol Campbell and Nick Barmby of Tottenham, Tim Sherwood of Blackburn. The Wimbledon defender Warren Barton is in once again and likely to play with Liverpool's Rob Jones on Coca-Cola Cup duty. Well, a few years back, as Clive Tilsley discovered, Barton's future seemed to be in the square mile of the city rather than in the England defence. I used to have to get up in the morning about 7 o'clock, get on my little moped then, which was a 50cc, uh, travel to work, do a day's work, get back on the bike, back to the, um, the training that we had to do on a, a Tuesday and a Thursday for non-league clubs and, the, and then play a game. This is the place where I used to work. What did you do here? I uh, was involved with the Tax and Print Centre. It was uh, collecting all the documents, uh, making sure that there was no mistakes and then giving them back to the, the clients. Well, I thought you were going to be a sort of whisk kid accountant one day, no? Uh, I may be if I would have stuck at it, but I had other things in my mind. Barton. Oh, it's over the head of Lukic, and it's gone in. A quite amazing equaliser by Warren Barton for Wimbledon. Warren Barton is making up for lost time. Seven years ago, he was almost lost to accountancy because Watford and Orient had told him he was too small to be a footballer. I was just a late developer. I think there's millions of kids, millions of people that were, was late developers, and uh, it seemed as soon as Orient let me go, within the space of six months, I'd, I'd grown about five inches and put on about a stone and a half, so it's, uh, it was their loss, not mine. Any good accountant would now assess that loss at around about three million pounds. That was the fee being bandied about when Barton was rumoured to be leaving Wimbledon earlier in the season. He's ambitious. He wants to play for the Manchester United of this world. Um, and so forth. And I think the opportunity will arrive for him one day. I think he will go on to get many caps for England and play for a much bigger club than Wimbledon. And is the, the fact of life that that move will come sooner rather than later? Yeah, I think it's a fact of life. Hopefully, uh, you know, it won't be this year, you know, because Warren knows the situation. But you never know in our game. I mean, at the end of the season or just before the deadline this year, if the phone goes and it's Manchester United and uh, the Blackburns are this world, then you listen. Only after leaving Wimbledon did the likes of Dennis Wise, Keith Curl and Terry Phelan gain international recognition. But Barton has already played for the England B team and is now set to emulate John Fashnu, the only man capped at senior level by England while still a paid-up crazy gang member. It was Fash who educated Barton in Wimbledon ways when he first arrived at the club wide-eyed from Maidstone. John Fashnu looked after me there. He was like the daddy of everybody and uh, 
I got on very well with people, and from there, it's you know, it's been a good five years for me. Was there a sort of an induction ceremony? Did they? Uh... They left it a little while. They don't do it straight away. I think we played Sheffield United away, and I said that in a paper, just one silly quote that I shouldn't have said was that I think we're changing, we're playing football, and the next day I was stripped, so uh, I won't be saying that again. Stripped and thrown where? Yeah, I was thrown in a big muddy puddle there and just left to uh, wallow around in the mud. A dozen Wimbledon players and officials will fly to Dublin on Wednesday to support Barton. His chance comes because Rob Jones has a prior engagement with Liverpool. But one thing Warren Barton has learned from life is to take his chances. Obviously, Jones is playing for a more fashionable club, and, and that would sway things maybe a little bit. It has done in the past with players here. Yeah. Do you think he's better than Rob Jones? I do, yeah. I think he's a, a, a better all-round player. I think Rob is very quick going forward, uh, whereas Warren, I think, can, his build-up play is excellent. He can play in the right-hand side, cut inside. He's two-footed. I'm not sure if Rob is. Warren can play equally strong in his left foot as in his right foot. The clubs go from strength to strength, you know, and you know we've got a few internationals, we've got a few old internationals as well. He used to play with Stanley Matthews, <laughs> used to score a few with him. And, and the chief is our uh, African connection. So, uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're enjoying it, you know, we're, we're playing what? some good stuff. People are, you know, saying that we can pass the ball now. What advice would you give him about trying to enjoy his international debut, somebody who's gone through it quite recently? I'd say put in as much for expenses as you can. Because <laughs> they try and knock you down anyway. <laughs> Perfect advice for an emerging international. But people regard Warren Barton as a late developer, but he's making his international breakthrough at, at roughly the same time as you did. Yeah, I would think the majority of players don't make the breakthrough until the mid-twenties. But he um, looks a talented player. Um, I remember his, his breakthrough a few years ago. They've got a tremendous system at Wimbledon, a scouting system or something, but they do keep producing very good footballers and he looks very comfortable on the ball and that's what we need, someone that, that can supply the quality players that we have in four positions that Jack Charlton talked about. OK, big match on Wednesday in Dublin. Now there was a time when winning the Vauxhall Conference carried with it the priceless promise of full league status. Sides like Wickham were quick to justify the confidence that had been placed in the non-league game. But last season, ground limitations meant that Kidderminster were denied the ultimate prize. And this season, Macclesfield, dominating the conference, looks set to suffer the same fate. Ray Stubbs reports on the mounting frustrations. 20 miles from Manchester, the borough of Macclesfield has a population of over 150,000. Macclesfield town has always been highly regarded in non-league football. Now it wants to take a step up. The Silkmen, as they're known, have made a reasonable impact in the FA Cup over the last few seasons. And under former Northern Ireland international Sammy McElroy, the Cheshire club are growing great guns in the conference. Last Saturday's 2-0 win over Telford confirmed their nine-point lead at the top of the table. And for many of McElroy's young side, winning Football League status is a burning ambition. It's fantastic. I think it's the best leagues in the, in, in the world. There's no doubt about that. And I keep on saying to the players, I mean, it'd be a great experience if we could get in and actually stay in there. It'd be a, tremendous for them, because we are a young side, and the young lads would really love it. Sammy McElroy is very aware that the title race isn't over by a long way, although the Cheshire club's toughest opponent is the Football League itself. The door to promotion isn't open to them, even if they win the conference. The top and bottom of the reason why is that Macclesfield failed to meet a December the 31st deadline to get their Moss Rose ground up to the minimum standard the Football League lay down. Yeah, we'll start off on this side and re terrace all around here, putting new barrier systems in to meet the, uh, the safety requirements of the Football Licensing Authority and uh, to meet the capacity of 6,000. Club chairman Arthur Jones points to an unavoidable hiccup in their redevelopment programme. Completion is now expected in 10 weeks. But that's too late for the Football League. Rules are rules is the message, and the invitation to make a recorded contribution to today's football focus was declined. Macclesfield are keen to put their case. We would argue on basically on what is fair and what is reasonable. Uh, we, we've had some problems that we didn't envisage on ground improvements, which have taken longer than we thought they would, and, and we have asked them to, be, to use some discretion on this deadline. But no discretion and no flexibility. No. And what Macclesfield find equally frustrating is that Chester City used Moss Road on 53 occasions while their new ground was being built. A change in the Football League rulebook means the compliment can't be returned. Chester's Diva Stadium is outside the Macclesfield conurbation. Macclesfield won't get anywhere near the pitch. They feel thwarted at every turn. 
it's a protection of their membership and they, uh, they basically are almost discouraging the promotion and relegation system from non-league into league. The Football League say they've had bad experiences with Barnet and Maidstone as non-league clubs being promoted into the Football League. Your reaction to that? Well, I would, I would use Wickham as an example, I think, uh, who have been very successful. I mean, having been promoted two seasons ago, they're now riding high in the second division. So it, it does work. And Macclesfield are working hard to get their case reviewed. Chairman Arthur Jones was in London this week, and with local MP Nicholas Winterton added to the squad, emerged from a meeting with Sports Minister Ian Sprout, optimistic that all wasn't lost. I was delighted and very happy that the minister indicated that he himself, as the Minister for Sport, will be writing to the League about Macclesfield's case and asking them in the light uh, of the case that has been presented to him and the inquiries and information that uh, he has got from his uh, officials uh, to look at Macclesfield's case and to review it. While the off-field debate rages, Sammy McElroy will concern himself only with results. Otherwise, the row is academic. We're in a nice position at the minute. There's teams coming up on the rails. And we can't sit back on our laws. We've got to go out there and try to win every game. A little bit of flexibility, that's all it needs, really. That's all we want. That's all we want. We're not asking for the moon, just a little bit of flexibility and say, well, we are ready. Can we take our step in the Football League if we do win the league? Got to sympathise with them. There does seem to be total inflexibility, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it does, really. And I mean, if, if the league's argument is that and they are going to be inflexible well you'd think they'd have actually come on and said it wouldn't you or, or, or shown what they really thought about it it does seem a, a little bit harsh yeah maybe we'll get a response from the football league in the weeks to come it's a shame we couldn't have had one in the context of that report but uh, we've got one last bit of action to bring you hazel irvin summing up the varied fortunes in this week's third round replays in the tenant scottish cup <laughs> They slipped up once before to Hamilton Ackies eight years ago, but the cup favourites Rangers made no mistake this time. Trevor Stevens' first goal in a year marks his return to full fitness. Frenchman Basil Bolly finishing off the second and then finishing up with a yellow card for overdoing the celebrations. And Rangers' other close season signing great Dane Brian Loudrup continues to earn votes for the Player of the Year award. Hamilton earned nothing more than a consolation. 3-1 it finished. The floodlights went out last week at Brockville and in the rearranged game Falkirk's cup hopes were snuffed out by Motherwell. Striker Alec Burns, only drafted in for the injured Tommy Coyne, has made noises about leaving the club in the past, but the 21-year-old won't be going anywhere after his cup double. A tortuous cup tie at Shieldfield Park had begged Rangers convinced they had the beating of Meadowbank in the last minute, 2-1. But Lee Bailey had other ideas. This literally the last kick of the 90 minutes forced extra time and ultimately penalty kicks. Steve Ellison, the hero for Meadowbank and perhaps with a future when Linford Christie retires. Heart striking duel meant double trouble for first division Clyde Bank. Kevin Thomas teeing up John Robertson. And it was a case of vice versa in the second half. The Scotland International returning the favour. Now it's Hearts Rangers in the next round. Holders Dundee United were held at home by Clyde last week, but the second division side finally succumbed in the replay. Billy McKinley with the first of five. And this was the best of them from Dave Bowman. A piece of wizardry from Trinidad's Jaron Nixon reinforced United's superiority and had his boss Ivan Golatz convinced the cup will be heading back to Tanadice. But the upset of the round was at Oak Hill View when second division part-timer Stenhouse Muir dumped St Johnston out of the competition and in style, Adrian Sprott carving another niche in Scottish Cup history, it was he who dispatched Rangers eight years ago. And it was quite a rout, 4-0 to the team from the Stirlingshire Village